Well, welcome to another session in the book of Colossians. I really hope that this has just been edifying and encouraging and a good exhortation uh, to your soul. I have, I have so been deeply blessed and encouraged by this particular study as we've been walking through uh, the book of Colossians. This has just been so good for my soul, and I just, I've really come to love uh, the book of Colossians, even though we're kind of doing it in a big picture view. We're not doing uh, verse by verse like I've done <laughs> in Ephesians, uh, but I love this big view. I love this uh, overarching declaration of who Jesus is. And uh, we've been walking through this section uh, that begins in verse 9 and goes down to verse 14. And we got through half of it last time. And uh, what I'd like to do is just read this passage. And then uh, I'd like to dive into the second half of this. Uh, so here's Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 9 through 14. And I'm going to read verse 21 through 23 as well. Paul says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the full knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then here's verse 21 through 23. And although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds, but now he reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Again, just an incredible passage. Uh, last time we were looking at the first part of this, the first few verses, and Paul, again, in verse 9, says, hey, for this reason, hey, we have heard, and I have not ceased to pray for you. Oh, and what is he praying? Look at this. That we would be filled up with the full knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And again, if you haven't listened to that study, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it. But Paul says, hey, could you somehow grab a hold of it? Could your life be filled up with the full knowledge of of God's will, not just in understanding, but in the practical application and actually living out the reality of his will. And then he goes on, the whole reason I am praying that, verse 10, is so that, and he gives four things. One of those is that we live in a manner worthy of the Lord. Again, it's that idea of a scale or a, or a balance. And the idea is that my life is to look just like Jesus. Well, how on earth am I going to live worthy of the Lord? Well, again, as we mentioned last time, the only option I have is for my life to be invaded by Jesus himself through his spirit. And when the God of the universe gets inside of my life, then and only then am I able to walk worthy of his life. And then he goes on, we are to, secondly, to please him in all respects, that, that the delight of our heart and our soul should be to please him. Just as a dog delights to please the master, so too we should delight in pleasing our God. Third, Paul says that we are to bear fruit in every good work, that, that there's something that should be coming out of our life, and he says it is called fruit. And then lastly, he says we are to multiply, if this is even possible, we are to somehow increase in that full knowledge of God. So Paul says, hey, I've been praying that you be filled up with the full knowledge. But now he says, oh, and I'm asking, I'm just praying, I'm zealous that you would somehow increase in this superior, full, overwhelming knowledge of who he is. And then lastly, we, we, or last time we, we finished up looking at verse 11, which says that he is going to, God is going to strengthen us with all power according to his glorious might. So according to his ability, according to his sovereignty, according to his authority, according to who he is, he is going to come into our lives 
and he's going to strengthen us with all of his overwhelming power. Now, if that is true, which it is, <laughs> wouldn't we live differently in this world? I mean, we would not fear. We, hey, we would have victory over temptations. Hey, there would be no reason to, to, to succumb into sin. Hey, we would not have to look like the culture around us. See, there would be something so radically different in our lives if we actually understood that the power of our almighty God has come to just be our strength, our enablement, this overwhelming grace in our life through his spirit. And Paul says, all of that's happening so that we can attain to steadfastness and patience with joy. And we looked at this last time, but, but th this idea of steadfastness is a, is a fortitude or an endurance that no situation can defeat. And the word patience here, in my translation, is, is basically that which is associated oftentimes with other people. So it's the patience and love no person can defeat. So here's this idea that, that Christians, you and I, are to be indestructible. We are to be immovable. Hey, we are to be victorious in every situation. No matter if it's, a, if it's a situation, a circumstance, or whether it's a person, we can triumph with joy because we've been strengthened with God's overwhelming might. Isn't that incredible? That is just so mind-boggling to me. Now, take all of that. And I want to look at these last three verses of this little section. Paul continues and he says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. I love this idea. There's this giving of thanks uh, to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, that word for giving thanks uh, is the Greek word eucharistio. And it's uh, where we actually get the word Eucharist, uh, that, the whole communion thing that we sometimes do on Sundays. Uh, but there's this idea of it's a thankfulness, it's a gratitude, uh, it's a deep appreciation. So look at this. Paul says that there is this, hey, because he strengthened us with his overwhelming power, because we are walking in steadfastness and patience with joy, we can give thanks unto the Father. But then look at this statement. This is so phenomenal. Who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, here's the question. What is the inheritance? Uh, what is this inheritance that you and I have been qualified to share in and participate in? Now, is it salvation? Yes, uh, but I think that's just an aspect of it. The reality of the inheritance of the saints in light, when you really get down to the idea our inheritance is Jesus himself. Isn't that an incredible thought? Uh, in John chapter 17, verse 3, this is what Jesus says about eternal life. He says, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So here's this idea that Jesus says, hey, you want to know what eternal life is? Hey, haven't you just been desirous to know what eternal life is? Eternal life is knowing. And that word know isn't just academic knowledge. It's just not uh, perception or understanding. It's, it's knowing through intimacy, through relationship, through experience, that this is an intimate kind of a knowing. He says, this is what eternal life is, to get wrapped up in the relationship and intimacy with me. That's what he says. Isn't that incredible? He says, I am your inheritance. In fact, this idea is all through the Old Testament and through even the New Testament. But it's this idea that our inheritance is God himself. And, and we're not going to dive into this in this study, but if you want to study this out, it'd be really fascinating for you, for you to do this. When you actually look, that, look at this idea that God has an inheritance, well, what is God's inheritance? Us. And so there's this neat idea about the inheritance that we receive an inheritance, which is him, and he has an inheritance, which is us. Which is very similar to that whole idea of Christianity, that, that Christianity is my life in Christ, and so I'm in Christ, and yet Christ is in me. And it's that twofold reality that makes up Christianity. I'm in Christ, and yet Christ lives in me. And in the same sense, or in that same manner, oh, my inheritance Hey, what I get to experience 
for all eternity is greater and greater intimacy with Jesus himself. And what is his inheritance? Oh, me. That is such a phenomenal concept throughout the scriptures. Oh, it's such a phenomenal concept. So Paul in verse 12 says, hey, I'm giving thanks to the Father, or we're giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us. He has done all the work so that we can share in this inheritance. And again, the inheritance is him. I love this passage from Ephesians chapter 1. He's talking about the blessings that we have in Jesus. And this is what Paul says, that in him, in Jesus, you also, after listening to this message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Paul says, do you realize what the Holy Spirit is in our life? He is a pledge of our inheritance. That he is a down payment is really what the word means. Uh, So I go out to buy a house, and they say, hey, you need to put a 10% down payment on the house. And it's a guarantee, it's a surety that I'm going to keep paying on the rest of the house. Ponder this idea. Do you realize That when we are filled with the Holy Spirit of promise, that outpouring that happened at Pentecost, that you and I get to experience, that the outside God has come to indwell our lives, when that reality takes place, Paul says, "Woo! that is merely a guarantee, a surety, a down payment, a pledge of our full inheritance. Meaning what? Well, he is the, he's the 10%. Now, ponder this with me. Life with Jesus through the Holy Spirit in our lives, this side of eternity is so good. I mean, it is, it is so mind-boggling to consider. Hey, if you ever read Christian biography and you just look at the relationships that some of these old saints had with God, whoa, I mean, it is so rich. Hey, when you read the old books, you're just like, wow, they, they had something. Do you realize that they are still only experiencing maybe I mean, maybe a 10% reality of what we get to experience for all eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I, I mean, I might be squeezing out 2%, maybe. I mean, just maybe. I mean, I know there's so much more this side of eternity. That this thing can just keep getting better and better, and this thing can keep growing and growing. And I mean, could you imagine how good eternity is going to be if, if what we, as good as it is this side of eternity, if this is only going to be a down payment of what we get experience for all eternity. That is just, wow, that is mind-boggling to me. And yet we are so, aren't we so satisfied with so little? I mean, it's like God is opening himself up saying, hey, I have this bountiful inheritance and you can help yourself. Take as much as you want. And yet we are so satisfied with so little when it comes to Jesus. When it comes to our spiritual lives, wouldn't it be interesting if you and I just had this overwhelming passion, aggression, zeal, that just said, Lord, I want as much as possible this side of eternity. So Lord, if what I get to experience in the Holy Spirit is, is a 10% down, down payment of all eternity, Lord, could, could somehow you and I, just through that intimacy and experience, could somehow I could somehow I attain 11, 12% this side of eternity? Is that possible? Oh, and if it is, I want it. Because again, I, I am so convinced that, I mean, yes, salvation is a part of our inheritance, praise the Lord. But the reality of that, the reason we have been saved is so that we can actually have intimacy and relationship with the living God. And he, for all eternity, is going to be our overwhelming inheritance. We do not get land. We do not get new cars. Hey, we don't get gold, mansions. Who cares about that stuff anyway? If you can have relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of the entire creation. If that is true, why are we so satisfied with so little. Shouldn't you and I just go crazy about Jesus? Shouldn't you and I just, just go just off the charts when it comes to pursuing him? Shouldn't we just delight ourselves in spending time in the word and spending time in prayer and just going after Jesus and going after Jesus and going after Jesus? Why? Because, 
wow, I want to experience as much of my inheritance now as I possibly can. And again, our inheritance is not a thing that he gives us. It's himself who we get to have relationship with. So ponder this again in verse 12 of Colossians 1. Paul says, wow, because he is strengthening us with all power and he's working this steadfastness and patience with joy in our lives, we can continually give thanks to the Father who has done all the work in our lives so that we can share in this rich inheritance that we have, which is Jesus. And that inheritance is that inheritance that all the saints get to participate in. That is incredible. That is just phenomenal to me. That is amazing. I want to look at verse 12. and, and uh, Sorry, verse 13. Verse 13 really is a big focus, uh, the heart of this particular passage, and it is all about the transfer of the kingdoms. Uh, that there's this transition that has been taking place. See, he has strengthened us, and, and he has done all the work so that we can share in this inheritance. Well, how did that come to be? How is it that we get to have this incredible inheritance in Christ? And Paul says, uh, in, in verse 13, he says, God has rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of his love. That God has done this incredible work. Well, what has God done? Oh, think about this. Your life is full of sin and darkness, and you, as Paul says, are under the authority of darkness. And that idea of the authority of darkness is, is, a, is a language that's used throughout the New Testament to talk about the fact that it's under the power uh, or the dominion of, of Lucifer, of Satan. So when we have sinned, we have really come under the authority of darkness. And God, uh, Paul says, God has done something incredible. Here you are, full of sin. Here you are under the authority of darkness. Here you are just creating sin, as he says in Ephesians chapter 2, that you are, so, you are so delighting in this world, you so love darkness, as he says in John 3, or as Jesus says in John 3, that you so love this world over here that you were just, oh, you were just so excited. This thing just, and yeah, it's, it's miserable, but, but man, you were just, oh, you lived in the sin, you delighted in the sin, and you were miserable in your sin. And yet God, in his overwhelming love that he has for you, as Paul would say in Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, while we were still living in this authority of darkness, hey, while we were shaking our fist in God's face in rebellion, Christ died for us. And what did God do? He took us from this kingdom of darkness. He took us from this place of sin. He took us from this realm and the authority that, that sin had in our life, that darkness was, that had this consumption of our soul, and he really rescued us from this place and transferred us into a brand new location, which is the kingdom of his dear son, the son of his love. That is an incredible, incredible declaration of the gospel. Uh, that word there for rescue is really interesting. It means to rescue, to deliver, or to free from imprisonment. See, you and I cannot rescue ourselves. See, you and I can never do enough good deeds. See, you and I, when we're locked in sin, we are chained under the authority of sin. Uh, Paul in, in Romans 6 says that when you yield yourself unto sin, it will use you as a weapon of warfare, as an instrument of unrighteousness. That, that sin has this dominion. Sin has this authority in your life outside of Christ. But what did he do? He rescued us, that he paid the cost, and he came and he brought us, he saved us, he rescued us from this location. And he did something incredible. It says that he transferred us. That word transfer means to move or to remove uh, or to deport. And what's really interesting is this is the word that was used to describe the deportation of a population from one country to another. And so listen to this, what this one scholar says. He says, in the ancient world, when one empire won a victory over another, it was the custom 
to take the population of the defeated country and transfer every man, woman, and child to the conqueror's land. And you can see this even throughout history. Uh, For example, the northern kingdom called Israel uh, was really captured uh, and like conquered by, by Assyria, and therefore they were taken off into Assyria and kind of dispersed. Uh, and the southern kingdom was conquered by Babylon. And of course, they were taken and brought, a lot of them were brought to Babylon and they were dispersed over the Babylonian Empire. Uh, and in relationship to the book of Colossians, this is interesting. I found that Antico- and Antichicus, or how do you say his name, the Great, uh, who ruled a couple centuries B.C., transported at least 2,000 Jews from Babylonia to Colossae, and which is one of the reasons we know there was a big Jewish population there. And th- again, this was during the big Hades of Colossae and before the city uh, shrunk down to a small town. But it's interesting uh, here, there's this conquering that's happened. And then again, these people were moved to another location. So ponder this. It is interesting to me that earthly rulers would conquer and then deport their defeated enemies. So they would, they would conquer a people, then they would move their enemies somewhere else. But think about this. God rescues us from our enemies and then brings us, transports us into his kingdom. So get this idea. Here you are lost in sin. Here you are under the authority of darkness. Here you are just chained to sin and death. And what did God do for us? Well, because of the cross, he literally saved us. He rescued us from this realm, from this kingdom of darkness, and he brought us as a people over to this new kingdom. Well, what's the new kingdom that we experience? Oh, it's the kingdom that has always been the right and true kingdom. Hey, this is what we were made for. Hey, this is what what we're supposed to experience. It's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's the kingdom of light. It's the kingdom of the dear Son. So you and I no longer dwell in the kingdom of darkness. You and I get to experience and live in the reality of the kingdom of Jesus. And I love this idea that one of the things that Paul is doing is making this declaration that there's only one true and rightful king. It is Jesus. And we've been rescued and set into his kingdom. That is amazing to me. Now, again, in this passage, Paul is talking about this transfer of kingdoms, and he uses the language of dark and light, that we've been removed from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Now, if you'd like to do a deeper study of this, I'd highly encourage you to read the writings of John. John and 1 John especially, uh, the book of Revelation, uh, John loves the contrasting language. You know, light, dark, death, life, all that kind of stuff. He just uses that over and over. And he has some incredible just imagery and insight in this idea of dark and light, death and life. I want to kind of, again, if you want to say that, I highly encourage you to read the writings of John. I think it'll give you a great insight uh, even into our passage. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. I want to give you another perspective that I think is just so profound to me. And it's the whole creation account. Uh, When when you come to Genesis chapter 1, here you have this world full of darkness and chaos. And what did God do? The first thing that God did in the midst of the darkness and the chaos is he spoke forth light. And I think that's such an incredible imagery of the gospel itself. Because Again, and I, and I fully believe that the creation account happened. I believe it's historical. I believe it actually took place. Uh, hey, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not downplaying this. I'm not just trying to allegorize it. And yet, though it is historical and though it actually took place and, and though God spoke light in the midst of darkness, it is a picture of a greater reality, which is our life in Christ. Because here my life is full of chaos and darkness. And what did God do in my life? Well, God came into my life and spoke forth light. Jesus, he is the light. And when my life experiences this overwhelming reality of light, Paul says, do you know what we have to call you? We have to call you a brand new creation. Because just as stark and as amazing as the first creation was for God to speak light in the, into the midst of darkness, so too you who are full of darkness and chaos, God has spoken light in the midst of your darkness and chaos, 
and brought forth a new reality, so much so, so incredible, that we have to call you a new creation. I also find it interesting when you look at the creation account uh, of how the Jews marked time. Biblically, time is marked from evening to morning, uh, that the day starts in the evening at, at sundown, and, the, and it, you know, it goes through the morning. Isn't it interesting that the Israelites, that, that the biblical time, the way that time worked, is you're moving from darkness into light, evening, morning. And yet we as Gentiles, isn't it fascinating that we mark our time from midnight to midnight, that we go from darkness to darkness? And again, I don't want to read too much into this, but I just find that interesting in light of the reality of Scripture, that here, here we are, the whole Gentile, the world itself measures time by darkness to darkness. Darkness moves into darkness. And yet, biblically, darkness moves into light. I don't know what you want to do with all that. I just find that intriguing to me. I just, I just, I just find that fascinating. So when you come to the passage, again, there's this interesting transfer that's being taken place. There's this phenomenal reality of you going from darkness into light. And here's some ways you could say it. We're, we're moving from darkness into light or from blindness into sight. Uh, that we're moving from slavery to sin to freedom and victory in Christ, which we call redemption. That we're moving from condemnation to forgiveness. That we're moving from the power of Satan or the power of darkness to the power of Christ or the power of light. And again, this idea is all over Scripture. Let me just give you a few passages. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, uh, John the Baptist is talking and it says that the, or it's referred to John the Baptist, it says that the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death upon them a light dawned. And again, it's in the context of John the Baptist, but it's the fact that there's this new reality of the kingdom taking place, and, and the Messiah is coming, and all that was prophesied in Isaiah is coming about. In John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In Acts 26, uh, Paul is recounting what Jesus did to him on the road to Damascus. And in, in that declaration, he says that God has commissioned me uh, to, to preach to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Jesus. Uh, in 1 John 1, 6, John writes, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if you're going to have fellowship with Christ, you must walk in light. Ephesians 5, 8 says this, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So get this idea. You have been transferred from this domain and authority of darkness, and you have been brought and rescued into this new reality of the kingdom of the Son. Isn't that phenomenal? Now, here's what Charles Spurgeon said of this whole thing. He says, Beloved, we are still tempted by Satan, but we are not under his power. We have to fight with him, but we are not his slaves. He is not our king. He has no rights over us. We do not obey him. We will not listen to his temptations. Why? Because we're no longer under that authority. We no longer have to be pushed around by darkness. We no longer have to be slaves to sin. Hey, no longer are we under the thumb and the pressure of temptation. Hey, yes, you may be still tempted, but you never have to give into it. Why? Because you have victory and triumph and hope and freedom in Jesus Christ. And we are no longer in the kingdom of darkness. We now get to experience the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the dear Son, Jesus Christ. Wow, that is amazing to me. And then Paul says in verse 14, <clears throat> talking about this idea of redemption and forgiveness, uh, Paul says in verse 14, in whom, speaking about Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
So God has done all the work, and he has qualified us to share in his overwhelming inheritance, which is himself. And he's really taken us from this realm of darkness. He's rescued us from this, and he brought us over, and he transferred us into the kingdom of his son. And it is this overwhelming beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Uh, that word redemption means a release by a legal ransom. It's to release a prisoner by payment uh, of a ransom. And the, the way it's often used is this idea of uh, the, the blood of the lamb in Egypt. So, so here, are the, here are the Israelites, they were slaves to Egypt. And how were they freed from Egypt? Well, there was a ransom that was paid. It was the blood of the firstborn, of course, of Egypt, but the blood of the lamb for the Israelites. And there was this ransom paid, and it set them free to be able to enter into the promised land. In a similar sense, you and I have been enslaved to sin, to Egypt. And you and I have had a ransom paid on our behalf. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, look, look at this, Mark 10, 45. Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Or 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. See, we have redemption. We have been set free. Our ransom has been paid by the blood of of Jesus Christ, the one in whom we now experience relationship in his kingdom. But it's not just redemption. It's not just this pay of ransom. It's also this idea of forgiveness. That word forgiveness, it means a formal release from an obligation or debt. It's a pardon. It's a cancellation. And the idea is to cancel a debt. And so here's the idea. I am chained to sin and death. I'm under the authority of darkness. And the legal requirements that was, that was necessary to free me. That ransom was paid by Jesus. So I've received redemption. I got to come out. But if I, all I did was get to come out, I would still have all these blemishes in my life. So what did he do? He looked at the sin in my life and said, oh, not, not only am I going to redeem you and rescue you from this realm of darkness, I'm also going to forgive you of your sins, and I'm going to cancel all that debt. And in fact, I'm going to throw your sin as far as the east is from the west. It's going to be behind my back. I'm not going to look at it, and I'm going to literally cleanse, clean, transform, wipe just your sin so that it's no longer before me. And you and I are no longer bound by the, the spots and the stain of sin of our past because you and I in Christ have been forgiven. If we actually knew that, we would be jumping up and down. That is so phenomenal to realize that he did all the work. And all I need to do is surrender and submit and give my life to him and, and make him Lord of my life, or maybe better stated, surrender my life so that he can be Lord of my life. See, when he has come in, he is going to transform me. He's forgiven me. He's rescued me. He's redeemed me. He's ransomed me. He's done all the incredible work, and I get to experience life in his kingdom, which is all wrapped up in the person as I get to experience my inheritance and relationship and intimacy with him. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 1, 7. He says, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That we have all of this according to his overwhelming grace that he has supplied in our lives. Now, what I'd really like to do in just for just a couple of minutes is I want to give you a quick recap of that whole thing. Because what Paul does in our passage is in verse 9 through 14, he's, he's talking about this incredible reality and he's praying this prayer. In verse 15 down to verse 20, uh, which we're going to start looking at next time, is this declaration of who Jesus is. It's like Paul gets so excited about the fact that we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of Jesus, and he goes, oh, let me talk about Jesus. And he gives this incredible exhortation about Jesus. And then coming out of that, in verse 21 through 23, 
it's like he repeats a lot of what he just said in verse 9 through 14. And I figure since it works really well in conjunction with what we're talking about, uh, I wanted to just look at it here and, and now. So look at verse 21 through 23. Let me just read it again just so it's fresh in our minds, and I want to quickly talk about it. Paul says, <coughs> excuse me, he says, Although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds, now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, in which I, Paul, was made a minister. So again, it, there's a lot of recapping of what we just had talked about, the fact that we were brought from the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of light. Paul says, wow, let me, let me rephrase all of that for you. And he does it this way. He says, Hey, you were once, hey, back in the day, you remember that whole kingdom of darkness thing I just talked about, Paul says? You were, verse 21, formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds. See, you were living in your sin. You were shaking your fists in rebellion to God. Hey, you were living in just your sin and this evilness in both how you talked your words, and how you lived your deeds. In your mind, in your, in your actions, hey, this whole thing was wrapped up in evil and sin. And then verse 22, he says, but now. So that was who you once were, but that's not who you currently are. Because what did God do? He rescued you and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. So Paul says, yeah, that may have described your life before. Yes, you were full of sin. Yes, you were full of depravity. Yes, you were full of the world. Yes, your whole mindset was wrapped up in that stuff. All of your actions were just full of, of the world and of sin. But that's no longer who you are because God has done an incredible work and he's brought you into a new reality. And in verse 22, he says, look at this. God has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him, holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. So he says, God has reconciled you. He's, he's brought this relationship. There's a restoration of relationship. In order to present you before God, and he gives three things. He says, he's presenting you holy, which means set apart or unlike the world. He's presenting you blameless, which means unblemished or without defect. Uh, physically, it was used for these sacrifices uh, when they would find a little lamb and they had to make sure it was without blemish. So there's no, no broken bones. So physically, it was without blemish. Uh, but at least in this context, it's talking morally, right? That you and I are to be morally uh, blameless. And then we're to be beyond reproach, which means blameless, without accusation. Uh, it's not able to bring judgment or accusation against. Uh, that word without uh, uh, or beyond reproach uh, that word is also used in Ephesians 5 in relationship to sexual immorality. And he says that, hey, you are a saint, so sexual immorality should not even be named among you. In other words, you are to be above reproach. And the, the concept is that, not that we don't talk about it, we're not going to name it, just, just be quiet. It's not that idea. The idea is basically uh, we could walk through your life and we could go through it like a fine-tooth comb and there would be none of that stuff in your life for there to be an accusation against. And Paul says there should be no sexual immorality in your life, in, in Ephesians 5. He said there should be no, you know, there should be no pornography, there should be no lust, there should be no de de sexual depravity in our lives, that if the world was to go through our hearts and our minds and our, and our actions, they could not find anything to say, well, look at that. There, I, I can bring an accusation against that. Now, a, a lot of you, I'm, I'm fairly sure, <laughs> a lot of us are just like, how is that even possible? Because there's still spots and stains and all this kind of stuff. P the world could find accusation. And that's what's so phenomenal about the passage. Paul says, hey, that once defined your life, that no longer has to define your life now. And what Jesus is doing is he's doing the sanctifying work of God in your life to bring about a reality where he is bringing you before the Father and he's presenting you holy and blameless and beyond reproach that you don't look like the world around you. You don't act like the world around you anymore. He is, he's removing all that junk from your life 
so that there's nothing the world can put its finger on outside of Jesus. In other words, the reality of the passage is God has done such an incredible work in your life that he's making you more and more like Jesus. Or as Romans 8, 29 says, that he's conforming us, he's shaping us, he's transforming us to look ever more like Christ. Isn't that an encouraging thought? So if I can encourage you, if there is spots and if there is blemishes and there are things that the world could see in your life that should not be there, well, surrender those afresh to Christ and remember that, hey, that was the old former way of living. That is not how you are to live anymore. That by the strength and the power, as he is strengthening us, as he's resourcing our lives, as he has conquered and he's bringing about a greater victory and triumph in your life, he wants to present you holy and blameless and above reproach where there's no junk in your life outside of the reality of Christ. That that's the only thing that is there in your life. We need Jesus. And I get that that's probably a lifelong process. Because <laughs> there's, God's always working deeper and deeper and deeper into our lives. Praise the Lord. But can I encourage you? His goal is not just to pat you on the head and let you keep living in sin. See, you have been transferred in the kingdom of his dear son, and now he wants to do something radical in and through you. He wants you to look like Jesus. And not that you become Jesus. Hey, we understand that. But there should be a great reality of your heart that you're ever being sanctified to look more and more like him, that we are being made holy more and more every single day, that we are being more blameless and above reproach every single day. So let us not make excuses for sin. Let us not just say, well, yeah, 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 that's just how I am. That's my personality. That's just my disposition. See, you cannot say that in the reality of Christ because he has transferred you from this kingdom. He's brought you into the kingdom of the dear son, and now he's doing everything in your life that you need for life and for godliness. Will you trust? Will you surrender? Will you put your faith in him? Will you, will you abide in that reality and not justify sin? He has given you all things that you need to live a victorious, triumphant life in this world. Will you live in that? Uh, lastly, Paul says in our passage, and it's rather an awkward, <laughs> awkward declaration, in verse 23, he says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. And it really, it just really bothers a lot of people because he starts the word, or at least in the English, it starts with the word if. So if you continue in the faith, what? If you continue, and, and I know that this is some theological uh, landmines. <laughs> I, I get that. Uh, it is interesting that the way it's being used in the Greek, it is conditional. So this may be true. It may not be true. You may continue in the faith. You may not continue in the faith. You can do whatever you want with this theologically. It is interesting, though, that the presumption, even in the Greek, is that there's an undercurrent uh, of... of uh, of confidence uh, and not doubt. In other words, it's not like, well, I'm not sure you're going to make it. It's more of the idea of like, hey, I know this is possible. I know you can do this. Hey, I'm confident that you can stand firm and sure in the faith. That's what Paul's saying. It is interesting, though, in light of that, as we get into chapter 2, which we'll eventually get to, as you get into chapter 2, Paul is talking about false teaching. And there is a great concern that Paul has that it seems like, well, you could, be, you could drift away. Uh, that you could get so wrapped up in this false teaching that you eventually lose the reality. That you lose grasp on that which is true. So look what Paul says. He says, if you continue in the faith. And again, it's not a presume that you'd lose it. It's just, he's saying, I'm, I'm confident that you're going to keep walking in it. I'm confident that you're going to be steadfast in this thing. But there's a possibility that you're going to get distracted by all this false teaching. And I think that's true today. But Paul says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Here's the whole point. Do you realize that you and I are not to be passive in our faith? Uh, there's this idea that runs all through Scripture. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, listen to what Paul says to the church in Corinth. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, 
but only one receives the prize. So run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, a crown, but we in an imperishable one. Therefore, Paul says, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. And I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He says, I I don't want to get to the end of this thing and realize that I've been doing all this work and yet I have been disqualified. Paul says, oh, would you, would you be steadfast? Would you maintain? Would you not grow passive in your spiritual life? You've got to stay firm and steadfast and keep pressing in. Uh, there's a similar idea in 2 Corinthians 13 uh, where Paul says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail that test? See, again, there's this overwhelming reality of the new covenant that just says, look, hey, God has done all the work. He has paid the price. He's the one that brought you out of darkness and brought you in the kingdom of the dear son. But you have got to stay fixed in that position. You've got to hold tight to Christ. You've got to keep abiding. You've got to keep trusting. Hey, you just got to, you just, hey, you cannot grow passive. You cannot be like, well, you know, I went to the altar and I said a prayer when I was five. Now I can live however I want to. See, that's not biblical, folks. See, you've got to keep pressing into Jesus. He's got to be first priority of your heart. He, you, you've got to make him king of kings and lord of lords in your soul. Uh, here's what one scholar said. He says, such emphasis on the need for persistence in Christian belief and conduct is a regular feature in Paul. In other words, if you look at Paul's writings, and I have a bunch of scriptures if you want to look these up, uh, either in the notes or on the screen. Paul is constantly saying, hey, you've got to be persistent. You, you can't just be passive in your Christian life. You've got to be active. So here's the idea. You cannot be passive in your spiritual life. We need perseverance and faithfulness and continuance and steadfastness in our faith. We must continually abide in the vine. And when you look at John 15, that whole phenomenal Im- imagery of, John, uh, of the vine and the branches, the moment you quit abiding, the moment you quit holding on to the life source, the vine, well, you're now dead. And the only thing that's good for that is burning. Would you hold tight to Christ? Hey, would you stay fixed in the kingdom of the dear son? Hey, would you go nowhere else but delight yourself in the reality of the kingdom? We need to remember as we looked at earlier, that Colossians 1.11, that we have been strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience with joy. See, he has done all the work. He is the one strengthening us. He is the one helping us maintain. He's the one pressing us in. He, it's his strength. It's his power. He's the one producing that steadfastness. He's the one producing that patience. He's the one producing that faithfulness in our hearts. See, this isn't about you and your activity. This has always and always been and forever and always will be about him and his work in your life. But you've got to maintain. You've got to hold tight. You've got to press in. You've got to stay surrendered. You've got to keep abiding in him. Or my favorite verse, 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given to us, granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. See, everything we need is in him. So there's no fear of falling away, but Paul says you've got to be firmly grounded and steadfast in this truth. Hey, don't get distracted by the things of this world. He's rescued you from this world and brought you into this new reality. Live in the new reality. You've got to stay here. You've just got to keep pressing in. You've got to, does that make any sense to you? I want that for you. I want that for me. We live in such a day where there are so many distractions. We live in such a day where, where we believe that we as Christians who have been brought into the kingdom of the sun can somehow on the weekends go and dabble in the, in the kingdom of darkness. See, there, there's not much difference between the people who live like the world and people who live in the church. And the reality is, is that that's not Christianity. See, God has done a phenomenal work and we don't have to live like we used to live. That is all over the New Testament. You are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. He has done all the amazing work in your life. 
Would you maintain, would you be steadfast, would you be faithful, would you hold tight to the vine, Jesus himself? Would you live in the reality and experience what it means to have the inheritance of the saints in light? Jesus, oh, we need Jesus in this hour. We need men and women of God who refuse to look like the world around us, who want God to present us blameless and holy and above reproach. And he's done that in you. Would you go after Jesus? Would you not be content with how the rest of the church lives? Would you not be satisfied with the world? Would you just get wrapped up in Jesus? Which is the whole focus of the book of Colossians. Uh, if, you, if you're going to continue in this study, I'd love for you to be studying this with me. Uh, next time we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1 and begin our look at Jesus in verse 15 down to verse 20. Such an amazing passage. Uh, if you'd like a study guide to help you study this passage in advance, I'd encourage you to click the link that's below uh, this video, or if you're listening to the audio on a podcast, it should be in the, in the show notes. Uh, but I would encourage you to study this with me. This passage, verses 15 through 20, may be one of the most grand declarations of Jesus in all of Scripture. It is so rich, and I'm so excited to get into this passage with you. But again, pursue and get wrapped up in Jesus. Mm, pray with me. Uh, Lord, we need you. How, Lord, we live in a day where we desperately, desperately, desperately need men and women of God who don't look like the world, but who showcase to the world what it means to be rescued and transferred in the kingdom of the beloved Son, Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would remain steadfast and we would remain grounded in the reality of who you are. Lord, I pray that we would not rest upon our own work. We would not rest upon what we can do or what we have done. But Lord, this is all about you and what you have done and what you are doing in and through our lives. So Lord, this has never been about our accomplishment. This has never been about our ability. This has never been about our work. So Lord, would you give us the grace and would you strengthen us with all power by your glorious might to stay fixed and maintain and steadfast in the reality of who you are. Lord, we need that more than ever before in this day. Lord, would you showcase your grand, phenomenal gospel? Yes, through our lips, but even more so, may the world behold you as they look at our lives and see this passage come to life, that you have done this incredible work within us, and we no longer live in the kingdom of darkness, but in the kingdom of the beloved Son. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory, for you are worthy in your precious, powerful name we pray. Amen.